power feeders aren't often used on jointers, um, and uh, there are a few reasons for that. Most uh, power feeders are, are difficult to mount on a jointer, uh, and if you look around and see how other people have dealt with that problem, uh, they've either had to add a sort of accessory uh, mounting plate or a post to mount the feeder somewhere behind the fence. Sometimes you'll see people uh, wheel uh, another machine, usually a shaper with the power feeder mounted on it already into place and put it into position so the power feeder can be used on the jointer. Uh, but, uh, I don't think either of those are a particularly user-friendly way of, of getting a power feeder onto a jointer. Uh, the little Proteus being as lightweight as it is really kind of changes the equation. I mean, this is... This. It weighs less than 9 pounds without a power source, and with the drills that I recommend, it weighs less than 12 pounds. I'm always tempted to try to twirl it like a majorette when I do these videos, but uh, I don't have those skills. Jointers can be used for either face jointing, where the stock is flat on the table like this and you're primarily indexing off of a flat table, or edge jointing. In edge jointing, you are referencing largely off the fence and using the, the table to create the straight edge. So you'll need a, a completely different feeder position depending on which of those operations you're performing. So that's, that's another complication. If you really want to use a power feeder for all your jointing, you're going to need two different mounting systems. Uh, the little Proteus is so adaptable that uh, either or both of those operations are feasible. And I'm going to show you how it's mounted and, and demonstrate what it looks like. Because the mounting points are so close to where the torque is exerted on the workpiece, the torque experience on those mounting points is dramatically less than on typical commercial power feeders. And that's equally true with the, the little Proteus in its uh, face jointing position. The holder for edge jointing can be secured to the jointer with mag switch 150s. So two mag switches. This one will need a recess for the flange. Now get roughly in position. And then it's attached with four thumb screws. You then want to Take the feeder down for the thickest material you're apt to feed. Align the feed rollers to your fence. Position the edge of the holder to the edge of the outfeed table. And then lock down your mag switches. The only adjustment you'll be making on the power feeder is controlling for various stock of various thicknesses. The guard is basically not going to be able to function, so depending on uh, the material and your risk tolerance, you may want to figure out probably a magnetic attached guard to cover up most of the cover head. I'm not going to do that here in this video. I think this, this arrangement would be really beneficial for small joiners. So attach the drill securely and then you'll be reversing this uh, on, on a typical joiner feeder really runs in reverse. So that's it. This is now very securely attached. Uh, again, the geometry of the little Proteus, where there's not a large distance between where the, where the torque is felt and the attachment points, means you need a, a lot less force 
than a, than a typical long arm to a base. So I'll just demonstrate. The material here is six inch wide leopard wood, uh, dense Brazilian hardwood. Uh, as you can see the board has a pretty substantial bow to it, it's a good quarter inch bow, so it's going to take me four passes to straighten it. The jointer is an odd jointer, it's enormous obviously, but its, uh, its head is uh, a head that I had made, uh, a shelix head, to fit the existing babbit bearings. Uh, so it's a slightly slower R RPM than uh, a contemporary joiner in ball bearings. Uh, and uh, Shelix heads also require more power, so, and, and I've only got a two horsepower motor on this turn, so uh, you'll, you'll see it more on the face joining. I can't really take off a, a huge amount of material at once in this joiner, but I get a, a wonderful tear-free surface and uh, very flat on even a large board. The configuration of the little Proteus with the two feed rollers on the same shaft right at the beginning of the outfeed table works really well for face joining. So you have a, a wide board, you'll have uh, rollers bearing against six inches of height at the very beginning of the cut. And then the, the front end of the, um, of the bandsaw plate is slightly higher, it's shimmed up on the subplate so that the feeder is tending to force the board down into the outfeed table. It's For face jointing, you're going to have to mount the power feeder on top of the fence. Most cast iron jointers also have cast iron fences, which can be drilled and tapped. It's possible that some jointers you might need to put a block of aluminum inside the webbing on the reverse of the fence in order to get enough uh, a robust enough thread to hold the power feeder. And here on this old Atlantic jointer, I have a plenty solid fence. You want to use uh, larger than quarter twenty either 5 sixteenths or 3 eighths plates to secure it. And here you can see I use these giant kind of plywood washers. And you want to mount the feeder so that it's pushing into the fence. And since the joiner fence is so much higher than a table saw or a router fence, you're probably going to have to lower the position of the feeder. A good way to do that is to put a block of the thickness of the stock that you're going to join. up the four bolts and let it just drop onto the stock. Now we're ready to feed. So you should keep in mind that if you had a, a board that was severely bowed, feeder was kind of pushed down and, and eliminate some of that bow, and so it'll flatten it to that uh, distorted position, and then when it snaps back, 
it's going to be still bone. Uh, so this really works best for stock that's thick enough to be able to resist that uh, pressure, or stock that's close enough to flat to begin with, uh, that it's not going to be distorted from the polyphagous pressure. It's about 40 pounds of, of hold down pressure from the springs. The material I'm cutting here is 10 inch wide Hawaiian koa. It's a very dense piece of koa. Uh, I would say this is uh, denser than maple, denser than hard maple. Uh, and you can, you can see my, my, my joiner doesn't have huge amounts of power and also I, on that first pass I didn't have the feed rollers uh, set quite low enough and because the, the, the board had a slight bow to it, it's uh, getting thinner on the ends. After it's jointed, so it, it needs uh, more feed pressure to make sure that it's bearing down strong enough at the ends. In the first pass, you might have noticed that the board actually rolled up a little bit at the very end because it wasn't being held down hard enough. Uh, but after that first pass, uh, it, it was fine. I maybe had to help, help a tiny bit on that second one. And you can see the progress as I'm getting closer to a perfectly flat, clean surface. Uh, I took four passes to clean this board up. Uh, the, uh, here, the, uh, uh, the two feed rollers on the same shaft are on the outfeed side, so they're bearing down several inches into the outfeed table. But that's a pretty good position for those rollers to be. So again, uh, it's six inches spanning from edge to edge on those two feed rollers. Uh, again, that's a, that would be a big improvement of using any sort of standard power feeder with its two inch wide rollers uh, on a, trying to joint a wide board. Uh, commercial uh, jointer power feeders, which are $2,000 and weigh 100 pounds, have a very wide roller with, uh, with like metal spikes in it to make sure you get a really positive feed and actually say you're not you're gonna have to clean clean the board up uh, from uh, the planer from the spike marks. Uh, so it, I don't think those are in very wide use. Uh, if you were doing a whole bunch of this, this would save you a, a lot of uh, kind of backbreaking work. Well, you'll see the results here. It's, it's kind of kind of astounding. So I'm flipping, flip the board, flip the board over so that the jointed edge is up. And there's the piece of leopard wood that I jointed before. And they're they are dead flat. I actually took a feeler feeler gauge to uh, this combination to see uh, if I could poke it through. And it was about uh, four or five thousandths of an inch gap in the middle. And, and, you, and I couldn't get that through on the end. So that's about as close to perfect as you can get.